people living in the countryside have a different lifestyle. And when it comes to Israelis living in the countryside, it probably means that they live in a kibbutz and that's a whole different breed of people. So today I want to tell you a story about kibbutz communities and how they're handling this war in Israel. Let me paint this picture. You are a family that lives in a kibbutz, a community of about 600 people down south on the Gaza border. Or up north on the Lebanon border. Same kind of situation. You have a family home, you live on the land, everywhere you look there's green, there's fields, there's agriculture, there, if, if it's up north there's nice scenery with the hills with Lebanon on the other side. There's space, there's freedom, there's, uh, it's a type of country living that you don't get in the city. All of a sudden the attacks happen and you have to evacuate and you take your family and you put them up in a small hotel room. There's Say there's three kids, there's five of you in a hotel room, right? With your bags and probably your dog as well. It's definitely a change, it's a lot more cramped. Plus all the stress you're thinking about back home, if your house is going to survive, and the whole situation in general. But it's better to be safe. You're with your kids, you're out of harm's way, and a month goes by. When you left your house, it was still warm, but now it's winter and you have no winter clothes. And you can't leave the, the hotel because... Your kids are going to freeze outside. Of course, you can go buy them some clothes, but money's tight because you haven't been working for months now, and your house up there still requires payments. So money's going out, no money's coming in, plus all the stress of being cooped up inside. The kids are going crazy. The hotel is helping. The hotel is organizing activities for the kids. They can go draw and paint and, and talk to counselors if they need to because it's it's stressful but most of the time they're climbing up the walls and they're <laughs> driving you crazy plus the dog is there months go by and the winter is over you kind of manage people have donated clothing you did okay you you managed but you're still out of your element because your home is in a kibbutz you live in a pretty tight community you know everybody there you do things together you know all the kids your kids you're a big family so when you evacuated, you kind of evacuated together. And most, if not all of your kibbutz, but most of them, a lot of the families are still there in the same place. And you see them all the time and, and you talk and you start figuring out what to do next. What do we do? Do we go back home? Do we have a home to go to? Um, do we decide this on a family basis or as a community? What do we do? And there's, there's divisions now. Half of the kibbutz wants to go back now and doesn't matter what the situation is like. It's our land. We're going to stand for it. The other half says we'll never go there because we, we can't feel safe there or anywhere in between those two extremes. As a kibbutz leader, you try to figure out how to help your people because you can't have this division. You can't have them just just wasting their time in a hotel. You try to give them a, a temporary home. You try to find home for 400 families. So you go to Tel Aviv and you talk to construction companies and they tell you we have this building that's finished, uh, just needs minor work. It's already, uh, it's a brand new building that's just completed. Nobody has moved in yet, but we can figure out a way where uh, your people can move in for a year, let's say. The owners of the apartments will, will give you that space to use for a year. Great idea great cooperation on behalf of the of the owners it works out you bring your 400 families into this one building but you can't just have them live in empty apartments you have to uh, furnish the apartments so you figure out a way to have basic furniture donated for 400 apartments even so that's a big move and, and it's a lot better than a hotel and they organize uh, a kindergarten right there on the premises so that all the kids can, can be taken care of and, and uh, bigger kids can go to, to a local school there. Great, a lot better than a hotel, but still doesn't fix the situation. You still have a kibbutz that has major damage, needs uh, fortification, it needs uh, development, and, and it's you haven't been there for a year, so there's upkeep that hasn't taken place. All of these things as a community, as a lot of money, a lot of work, and where do you get all that? And 11 months after the attacks, these uh, kibbutz communities are, some have gone back already. Maybe not entirely, there's, there's some in the south that have gone back, they've started building, 
And they're going out in faith and building because most of the infrastructure in these kibbutz communities is pretty old. From whenever they were established back 50, 60, 70 years ago, because the organization that I work with has been helping for years, has been helping these different communities, I know these situations. So there's one uh, uh, one of these kibbutzes in the south has decided to go back. They came together and said, okay, we can't let this ride out any longer. We have to go back. We have to rebuild. And they're building a new community center. These people, these communities, they come together and they eat together. They have a big dining hall where everybody eats together. And there's other events that they have that, that happen there. So it's a big uh, venue that they have to build, and they're going to build it as a big shelter because there's very few shelters on the streets uh, of the, the community where people can run in and, and be safe from, from attacks. Plus, those shelters are not designed to protect from attackers in, in, in person, like in ground invasion. So this whole new building will have to be rethought, redesigned, and built as a, a bunker, basically, that will protect from any kinds of attacks. That one building is like a million dollars, right? But they have like five or six different projects around this kibbutz, uh, each one costing like a million dollars. And this is all money that they need to raise, rebuild their community, and go back and live there. Even though the threat of attacks is still there across the border, just a couple of miles away, even though the war is still going on, they stick together as a community. And they've decided, this one community has decided to, to go back and rebuild. Others have been waiting. Others have found other solutions, like I, I told you about in Tel Aviv. It's still very temporary. They're still going to have to move back. Everybody decides how to handle and how to work together. Even though there's divisions, even though there's arguments, but they're a community. Takeaway, in time of war, in time of stress, in time of, of problems, we all need community. And the more that we try to figure things out on our own, the harder it is. There's different challenges, there's different problems as a community, but having that support and knowing that you're also working to help others is always beneficial. So I hope we can all find our community. I hope we can all stay close to our people and grow together with our people. And that's the story for today. I hope you come back tomorrow to hear another one.